Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of Identity International's second webinar series, Palestinian Beyond Conflict. This series will be running throughout the month of December on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 5 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, where we will delve into the evolution of Palestinian identity with our esteemed guests. To receive notifications and updates regarding the series, please follow our social media platforms. And if you have missed any of our episodes, please check them out on our YouTube channel. Today, we will be in conversation with Ali Abu Neyma. Ali is a di the director of the widely acc acclaimed publication, The Electronic Intifada, an independent nonprofit publication uh, focusing on Palestine. He has written hundreds of articles and spoken on the topic all over the world. He is the author of One Country, a bold proposal to end the Israeli Palestinian impasse and the battle for justice in Palestine. Ali, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Uh, so the first question that I would like to pose to you, which is our running th theme throughout this entire uh, series, is uh, what does it mean to you personally to be a Palestinian? You know, that's a very simple question with a very difficult answer. And um, I think w one thing to say, I think it's changed over the years. And um, probably everyone goes through such changes. and. I probably can't accurately tell you what it has meant to me at every stage in my life, but what uh, it means to me now, of course, it means having a certain uh, family history and ancestry and, and connection to a place that um, you know I have rarely set foot in. I've been there a few times, but uh, I haven't been to. I, I the last time I was in Palestine was in. Gaza in 2013, uh, and before that it was quite a few years. And, and most Palestinians uh, have never been to Palestine. So it's, it's having a connection with uh, a place through uh, family connections. I still have, do have family living in Palestine, but also through stories and through, um, you know the 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 things my parents have told me and and still tell me um, uh, about their uh, childhood and their uh, memories of Palestine. Uh, so those things are probably very common to people from any any place in the world or or who are connected to any place in the world. But I think the other thing uh, that being Palestinian means to me and I feel this more and more, is it's a certain, it, it gives you a certain perspective on the world, uh, which is, at least for me, the ability to see where a lot of political hypocrisy lies. Because Palestine is often the test of, uh, you know, uh, as they say in America, it's where the rubber hits the road in terms of um, a politician's or a party's or an institution's or a media publication's willingness to be truthful, willingness to uh, apply whatever principles they claim to uphold, whether it's about free speech or human rights, you immediately see it when it comes to Palestine. You can tell right away if this person is a, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say bullshitter, but that's thats the word I mean, so I'm just going to say it. So its a, it gives you a certain clarifying perspective on the world. I think that's what I feel it gives me now. Um, so you've pers you've grown up in the United States and specifically in Chicago. How has it been maneuvering as a Palestinian in that society, growing up in you know uh, in Chicago and the way that you've seen you know so obviously within American society and being Palestinian and how often I mean it comes across as the two identities might clash in some way. Right. Well, I've lived in the, the United States for about 30 years. Uh, and before that, I lived, you can hear in my accent, I lived for some years in the UK and, uh, and in Europe. And I came to the United States when I was uh, 18 and have, have been here uh, ever since. So I've had experience of uh, a number of places. Um, I think, you know, in the United States, 
United States, and I think this is true in other places as well, at least from my experience of talking to other Palestinians, is that um, you often don't, you know, you often have this experience. This is common to uh, people from, uh, you know, almost any non European background when you're in the US or you're in certain countries where. Uh, people naively, they don't mean it naively, they'll ask you, oh, well, where are you from? Or they hear my accent, they say, where are you from? And uh, those conversations can be exhausting for a number of reasons. Sometimes you want to have the conversation, but often, you know, you just, if you're sitting on a train or a plane, you just want to be left alone. You don't, I mean, Americans uh, are very, talkative. It, I, I often have this experience where if you get on a plane, uh, the person who you're going to sit next to for an hour and a half or two immediately wants to have a conversation, tell you their whole life story. I mean, that might not be true in other parts of the world, but it's very true in the US. Uh, people are very open and very talkative. Um, and if you get into one of those conversations, then they'll inevitably ask, well, where are you from? And uh, I often don't want to say, you know, I'm Palestinian or my background is Palestinian because then you get into an exhausting conversation. Uh, you, you, you then become sort of uh, uh, responsible for educating them, responsible for uh, answering all their questions. And, um, you know, sometimes you want to have that conversation, but sometimes you just want to read your book. Or, you know, maybe I've just been doing that all day on a discussion like this or writing an article, and now I don't want to talk about it. So my the point I'm getting at is that the moment you say you're Palestinian, that is a very political, almost provocative statement. So... Uh, that's how it's perceived. I'm not saying that that's how it's intended, but that's how it's perceived. So I think a lot of, you know, my own experience and the experience of others i talk to is you really, you really think a few times before you say uh, you identify yourself as Palestinian because you have to think about, well, what it will mean in terms of anything from the relatively minor inconvenience of having to have a conversation you don't want to uh, possibly much greater discrimination that people experience. So um, that's an experience I've had many times. I, I don't know that Thank it's you. unique unique to Palestinians, but it's certainly one a lot of Palestinians have had. No, I can imagine that pretty easily, especially with it being on the news all the time and, you know, sort of uh, the Israeli perspective getting the limelight most of the time. So it'll be like, oh, what do you think, you know, about this matter? And uh, you're automatically put into a position that might not, not necessarily something that you might be um, looking forward to on, like, you know, just a quiet night. <laughs> uh, no, so it, it's interesting. It do how the responsibility that you just mentioned about being you know that you have as a palestinian do you think that uh, how do you think that comes about like you know that how has that made you feel growing up you know or just as you are at the moment is it something that you, you know have you struggled with it before i mean i'm sure i've struggled with it uh in the sense that i don't think i set out to spend most of my time doing work on Palestine or, or writing about Palestine. In fact, you know, when I was younger, that was something I uh, didn't want to do. Um, it's not that I was against it. It's just that I, I thought, you know, I would be doing something else. But it, uh, you know, that's that's the way uh, my work developed, and it's something that I was able to do. It's something um, I felt a responsibility to do. Um, it's not a responsibility that anyone imposed on me. It's a responsibility I felt uh, from within. And um, it's, you know, th there might be other things I could have uh, done for sure, uh, but uh, when I compare 
that to sort of the the costs and sacrifices that uh, other people um, you know have faced because of what they've contributed to the Palestinian struggle I, I've really given up nothing you know I've I've uh, had a, uh, a you know a, a, a fortunate background in terms of my education or the opportunities I've had and I've I, you know I, I don't feel I've made any sort of great sacrifice to uh, take on that responsibility um, and but you know it's it's something I do I, I I feel like I do what I can do you know I I, I use the whatever skills I have to, to do this work and um, you know that that's uh, you know what impact it has or what merit it has is is for others to is for others to decide. Uh, reasonable enough. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, what does lifta mean to you? Because we've gotten very interesting answers from people that have uh, you know thought about the pieces of land that they're from uh, back in Palestine or their parents, you know, their parents are from in pa Palestine. And it's so it's taken on a symbolic meaning for a lot of them. Has it had a similar experience for you? Well, Lifta is the village where my mother is from. And it's, it's uh, a village that is uh, west of just, you know, west of Jerusalem. Now it's sort of uh, surrounded by uh, Jerusalem. And it's the vill uh, and it was one of the first villages from which Palestinians were forcibly expelled in December 1947, as the Zionist militias began their assault on the city and, uh, uh, and on, on Palestinian villages all over Palestine. It was one of the first that uh, was attacked. There was an attack on a cafe in the village um, by a Zionist gang that killed several people and that uh, you know effectively terrorized the population into leaving and my mother recalls that you know she was a little girl at that time that they left um, first to stay with friends or relatives in an, another part of Jerusalem and eventually they went to Jordan where they became refugees so you know Lifta is a place I've always heard about all my life it's a place that still exists it's one of the few villages that is um, still largely intact. It's it's in ruins, but a lot of the houses are intact, and uh, that's unusual because um, Israel, after after it was established, they set about deliberately destroying many of the villages to leave no trace. And in, in fact, Lifta in recent years was the subject of. Um, an Israeli development plan which would have put luxury apartments there or something for um, for uh, probably for uh, primarily for Israeli Jewish residents and there has been a movement by uh, descendants of survivors and descendants of uh, the village of Lifta many of whom live in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem now uh, of going back to Lifta of holding ceremonies there of uh, of just being physically present in the village and there have been legal challenges to the plan which so far has not uh, proceeded and there are of course uh, uh, argue you know people saying quite rightly that this is not only do people have a right to return to Lifta but Lifta uh, should not be destroyed I mean no place like Lifta should be destroyed but it should particularly not be destroyed because there are so few surviving examples of a village like Lifta with uh, vernacular Palestinian architecture going back hundreds of years, and uh, it, it would be, you know, a, a yet another desecration to destroy it. So I have a strong personal connection to Lifta, but Lifta is also the story of hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages. Um, that uh, to which millions of Palestinians trace uh, their roots. It just happens to be the place that I have a personal connection to. 
My next question would be, uh, you have strongly expressed your support for a one state solution, which uh, isn't, you know, it, obviously it's uh, very, it's controversial uh, amongst, you know, Palestinians themselves and obviously in the international community. In a one state uh, sort of, you know, what do you see, what shape do you see Palestinian identity take, taken in within the state if it was to occur? So, well, that's a you know a very good question, and it's one where I think um, I mean I, I want to give you two answers or, or follow two strands of thinking on this. Um, you know, I think now there's a lot more openness to a one-state solution than a few years ago, or or when I wrote my book on it in 2006 or 2007. It's a, it's a much less controversial idea now, I think, because the so-called two-state solution is so discredited. But one of the uh, objections I would get, particularly from Palestinians, was that, um, I mean, you know, from some Palestinians, I don't want to suggest all Palestinians think the same, obviously they don't, but people tried, tied the notion of being Palestinian very strongly to having a state. So the reaction was, well, you know, you want to dis dissolve the Palestinian identity. You, you, you're going to like, we're just going to have no identity or you're, you're going to give that up. And my answer to that was, well, you have a very strong Palestinian identity, uh, but you've never had a state. So you, you have all this Palestinian identity, but no state. So why do you need a state to have uh, a Palestinian identity? However you define that identity, it has, it has never actually been tied to a state. It is actually m much more tied to statelessness, but it is no less strong for that. It is no less uh, deeply felt or... or or expressed because it has not taken the form of a state. I, I encounter that much less now, I would have to say. Uh, the, the idea that a state is central to sort of affirming and uh, protecting and establishing Palestinian identity is one that I hear less. Um, the other answer I want to give you is that these are uh, questions that you know, what, what is identity or what is a national identity uh, that are common everywhere. Uh, but where you might look specifically for, um, uh, I don't know, indicators or clues of the kinds of battles and struggles that uh, we would face in a one-state solution would be to play, and I've written about this um, would be places like uh, the north of Ireland where you have two what they call traditions, unionists and, um, and nationalists. Um, and there in the 20 or so years since the Belfast Agreement, which I think was in 1998, there have been efforts about, well, what, what do these identities mean when one of them the unionist identity has been particularly tied to domination and oppression of the other. So, you know, how, what, what, how can you remake an identity that does not have um, uh, sort of bigotry and domination and uh, built into it? Um, and so I think that those would be the struggles we'd face that is, is what, you know, whatever Israeli national identity is, Israeli Jewish national identity in particular, it is tied to domination. It is tied to, su to supremacy. And so I think the struggle would really be for uh, Israeli Jews to come up with <laughs> some kind of identity that is not about dominating the land, taking the land, um, holding uh, privilege and superior rights. Uh, and and that would, you know, so th those are the kinds of um, challenges of decolonization that we see uh, in in places like Northern Ireland and places like South Africa that are extremely difficult. 
uh, on a cultural level, but also on an economic level, because uh, if you take somewhere like South Africa, you see that economic inequality has actually increased since um, since the end of formal apartheid. Uh, and you know, even though people formally have equal citizenship, they don't have equal access to resources. Uh, so, so th those are the kinds of struggles that we have to look at and learn from. Um, that uh, you cannot divorce these issues of identity from questions of power and questions of um, economic justice and economic democracy, because people's identity is often is for you know there's people a lot smarter than me who write about these things but uh, the way i think about it is that you know identity is tied to power you know so in the united states so much of um you know white nationalist identity is tied to a notion that uh europeans have a natural right to rule this country that they with the people who established the United States and that the United States is a Christian nation and you know the, all these ideas that are tied to um, to domination and power uh, that that seem very naturalized by uh, those notions of identity so um, it's very hard to see where it would go but I, I think that um, you know people do worry about symbolic things like flags and anthems and languages and, and all of those things. But I think you really have to focus on, to a large extent, on the power relations that exist between these different identity groups. Would you say that a compromise is needed in that sense on both the Palestinian and Israeli side to bring about some sort of a resolution as to what a Palestinian slash Israeli state would look like? I don't know if compromise is the right word. I think you have to have inclusion and you have to have justice. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, some kind of common state, you would have, uh, you know, equal regard for uh, the languages people use. You would have um, you know, equal protection for people's ability to practice religion. You would have, um, you know, protection for people's various educational rights. Uh, and the, the question that, you know, a lot of scholars and thinkers uh, and people who look at these things struggle with is how to do all those things while at the same time producing, uh, you know, enough of a common identity that people feel that, you know, even though they have their own languages and their own uh, religions and their own, uh, you know, cultural institutions, that uh, there's also a, a common uh, allegiance and a common state or a common symbols that they can equally subscribe to. And, um, you know, there, there's, there doesn't seem to be sort of a, 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 an easy way to make that happen. Um, I think there is, you know, there are there are ways that facilitate that, but that is a tough challenge. But those are the things you you would have to you would you would have to balance. But just to be clear, there's no contradiction to me between having, you know, a single democratic state and people having, um, you know, uh, full recognition over their languages and cultural rights and so on. There, there's no contradiction there to me. Would you say with the normalization process that's taking place in the Middle East at the moment, as of recent, uh, you know, with uh, actually even North Africa and Morocco joining that club, uh, what impact is that having on this solution, you know, from actually taking place? And how do you think that's affecting the sort of Arab, the Palestinian, the relationship Arab, um, sorry, Palestinians have to the Arab world? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, uh, among Palestinians, a very strong opposition to those deals, but there's also strong opposition among the citizens of those countries where they can express it. You know, in Morocco, 
uh, there is near unanimous public opposition to normalization with Israel. And I suspect that's true in uh, other countries as well. It's true in Jordan, which has had a peace treaty with Israel for more than 25 years. It's it's very consistent. So these 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 agreements, these peace treaties, uh, haven't softened uh, public opinion. They haven't made people abandon uh, the support for Palestinians. But uh, they have, in some ways, they reduce the leverage Palestinians have because Israel is, in a sense, getting rewarded for for free. But that it's also important to know that these deals are largely formalizing long-standing clandestine or semi-open relationships that these regimes already had with uh, Israel. And I think it's a reminder of the geopolitics involved, which is that um, all of these regimes, including Israel, are essentially clients of the U.S. empire. And so they have an interest in, in sort of banding together uh, and the U.S. has an interest in making sure that its its sort of regional vassal states get along as well as possible. Uh, so there's geopolitics involved. How it will play out in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years is is hard to say. If uh, if the claim is that um, you know. Uh, oh, uh, Arabs and Israelis get along so well, then uh, why would, why would if, if, if Israel can have peace uh, and, uh, you know, great relations with Emiratis and Bahrainis and Moroccans, uh, as they claim, then why can't they have uh, equality with Palestinians at home? So in, in essence, uh, you know, it could, it could be construed as further undermining uh, arguments for the 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 racist and segregationist two state solution, uh, which often doesn't make coherent sense, uh, as we can see, you know, whenever the narrative is brought up. Uh, well, I mean, on our side, those are all the questions that we do have regarding, uh, you know, Palestinian identity. And thank you so much for that insight. Were, are there any concluding remarks that you would like to make regarding, you know? Sort of Palestinian identity, how it's evolved, or how do you think it's going to evolve? You know, a lot of our speakers have had messages for Palestinians themselves. Uh, would you like to make any remarks? I think one thing I'm more conscious of is that the, there is no single Palestinian identity. There are um, certainly things that uh, tie all Palestinians together. Um, Palestinian communities have had so many different experiences in so many different places as a consequence of their statelessness and their expulsion from their homeland um, that, um, you know, the, the identities that Palestinians have developed come from very different experiences. My experiences are very particular. The experiences of... Um, of uh, Palestinians who came to the United States in the 1980s as students and then settled here uh, are very different from those of their children and grandchildren uh, who, who were born in the United States as second generation or third generation uh, Palestinians. The experience of Palestinians in refugee camps in Lebanon or of Palestinians who grew up in the Gulf um, are very different. And so that that's the thing I, I would stress also is the um, um, multiplicity of Palestinian experiences that, um, that shape identity. And so we can't assume that. And there's also, of course, has always been a, a class aspect within Palestine and within Palestinian communities that, that um, like every society you have, um, uh, class distinctions uh, and rural versus city distinctions that are very um, uh, uh, strong. So a lot of the things that people uh, strongly associate with Palestinian identity, uh, uh, such as um, you know uh, embroidery or uh, agricultural practices or certain kinds of food, may be, may have been staples for. Uh, rural Palestinians, but not necessarily Palestinians in the city, 
they may have adopted them later or they may have adopted them as symbols in the diaspora. A lot of these are things that uh, I'm not an expert on, but they're, th they're things that I observe and think about. And um, so the, you know, those are some of the, uh, the uh, ways I would, those are the, some of the questions I would ask if I were um, setting out on a, a deeper or broader inquiry into Palestinian identity. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your incredible insight. And thank you to our audience for watching. Uh, our next episode will be on Saturday at the same time where we'll be in conversation with political activist and lawyer Lema Nazir. And uh, thank you again from Identity International.